the topic of modesty, subhanAllah, um, this is a topic that uh, I've been speaking about for a very long time. I feel like a lot of times when I get invited out to especially MSAs and even different communities in Masajid, they're like, you're young. Can you talk to our youth about modesty and, you know, how to behave with the opposite gender and this and that and you know, intermingling or mixing or whatever. Like this topic seems to always land uh, on my shoulders. And so I have spoken about it uh, at length before as well. And, and also I teach a seminar called uh, Trends in which we speak about uh, clothing, uh, the fiqh of clothing. And in that, the topic of modesty comes up as well, because one of the uh, principles when it comes to our clothing uh, is that we want to dress modestly. And so we have to talk about what modesty really is. Um, and over the years of talking about modesty, I always I've come to the conclusion that oftentimes the way we treat modesty, haya, is we try to put a Band-Aid on like a broken bone. What I mean by that is, you know, if you have a broken bone, um, you know, you put a Band-Aid on it, it's not going to do much. Visually, it might appear like you're helping the problem, but it's actually not doing anything. What needs to be addressed is the bigger issue, which is the bone itself. Like the bone needs to be set in place and put it in a, a cast or, or whatever it may be. Like, I, I, don't, I don't know how to set bones, but whatever you have to do to fix the bone itself, like that's what needs to be done. And so when it comes to the issue of modesty and, and haya, we oftentimes look at the problem uh, and how it is affecting our behavior, how it is affecting our dress. And we want to like put these, um, these band-aids on it. So for example, a parent uh, wants their daughter or their son to dress modestly. And they'll say, listen, you need to wear this and this and this, and you can't wear this and you need to do this and do that. Um, or a, a masjid is noticing that, you know, uh, the, the, the congregants in the masjid uh, men and women are not behaving modestly in their interaction with one another. Or you can substitute, uh, for a masjid, you can substitute an MSA uh, or a gathering of Muslims. And they'll say, okay, you know what? We need to have very strict rules about how you need to behave and and, and you need to, uh, you know, barrier. And I'll talk about a barrier in, in a little bit. Uh, a barrier in, in, in the masjid. Um, and so that is almost like putting a bandit on the problem because the, the issue of haya is the issue of the heart. Uh, Haya is from the matters of our heart. And if we don't solve the problem in our heart, then as human beings, if we don't feel the need to be modest and we, we don't understand the wisdom of modesty and we don't understand how it affects us in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we don't find value in, in behaving modestly and acting modestly, we're going to find ways around whatever rules someone may set up, whether it be in the household or in the masjid or wherever else. And so uh, I know it feels good to, to put those band-aids on and to say, you know what, because it, it gives the appearance of solving a problem. But if we really want this problem to be solved, we need to look at the heart. We need to address the heart. We need to address what is happening within us. And that is what dictates our behavior. And this is why these issues, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned this very clearly to us. He said, Ala inna fil jasadi mudgha. That in the body there is a piece of meat. If it is sound, if it is okay, then the rest of the body will be sound. However, if it is ruined, then the rest of the body will be ruined as well. Certainly that's the heart. I mean, if you don't solve these problems in your heart, then it's going to ruin everything else. And for us, when it comes to our behavior, in our dress, in our speech, in our interaction, all these issues, they stem from what is happening in our heart. And, and that is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned that uh, haya is from our faith. It is from our iman. Why would we behave in a, in, a, in a modest way? Why would we dress in a modest way? Why would we talk in a modest way? But it all goes back to our uh, faith. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, innal haya, uh, innal haya wal iman qurana jami'an. That haya, modesty and faith are two companions. فَإِذَا رُفِعَ أَحَدُهُمَا رُفِعَ الْآخَرُ if one is raised, then the other is raised. And likewise, the, the, the inverse of that, uh, or mafhum al-mukhalafa, as, as, uh, you know, as, as the scholars say, is that if, is, and this does not mention the text, but we understand that if one is lowered, then the other is lowered as well. Meaning they have that type of symbiotic relationship between the two of them. If our iman goes up, our modesty goes up. 
And if our modesty goes up, our iman goes up. And that's why people say, how do I become more modest? How do I um, increase my modesty? Well, the obvious answer is the answer of the Prophet wasallam that it is combined. They're a companion of iman. So we have to raise our iman. Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says that uh, when the servant of Allah has certainty that their Lord is looking upon them, then this will, and you know, this is not the exact words, but the meaning is that it will force their hand. It will push them to be modest. It will push the servant to be modest with Allah because now it is not about, you know, what is happening just in my worldly life, but it's about my relationship with, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why for us, al haya min al iman, haya is from iman. That is a central concept for us when it comes to our uh, modesty. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we know and understand that Allah is looking upon us, Allah is with us in his knowledge. Uh, he is with you wherever you are. Allah is all aware, all seeing of what you do. A person who lives their life in that way, you don't actually have to set a lot of rules for them. You don't have to say, you know, do this and don't do this and, and, and do that. Uh, and this is why, you know, the issue of um, a barrier in the masjid. And you, you all know I don't like to talk about controversial stuff, so that's why I'm mentioning the, the barrier in the, in the masjid. I've been to masjids that have a barrier and a very, very strict barrier. And I'm talking about like men and women are in, in separate, um, just complete separate areas, right? And there's, you know, some, some masjids at least have like a camera where the, the women can see the men uh, because actually the women need to at least be able to see the imam, by the way, because that's how they follow salah. And that is why if you've ever been to a masjid uh, and there's no... Uh, the, the women, the sisters cannot view the imam at least, and the imam makes a mistake, it's chaos. Uh, I haven't experienced this, but my wife has told me this, my mom, Allah uh, she has she had used to mention this to me, my sister has mentioned this to me, a lot of women have mentioned to me, uh, in that situation, I, you know, I usually ask my wife, you know, in a case like that, I'm like, well, you know, what happened? The imam made a mistake, and she goes, it was a disaster. Some women are in sajda, some women are in ruku'ah, some women are doing this. So it's just like nobody knows what they're doing, right? And so, and that's a side point. I apologize for going on that tangent. But there should at least be, the, the women should at least be able to see the imam, what the imam is, is doing. But I've been in those messages where there's no contact, right? And that's fine while they're in the masjid. But if tarbiyah is not given to the community, then as soon as these young men and women step out of that very con very confined environment, they're going to just find ways to interact in, in impermissible ways outside of the masjid. And I've also been to masajid where there's no barrier. And I'm not, by the way, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not for one or the other, right? This is not the point of my talk here. It's not a point of, of me saying that. I know a lot of people are thinking uh, that I'm giving my opinion of having a barrier or not. I don't have an opinion. I think every community needs to ask their imam and fit the needs of their community. That's my official answer. So I'm only taking questions about a barrier <laughs> at the end. But I've been to I've been to, I've been to communities where there's no barrier. But the imam gave such tarbiyah. He educated the community in such a way that I, I saw these brothers and sisters and, and they are the most modest in their behavior. That I haven't even seen this in, like I said, uh, you know, masajid communities and, and even like uh, um, societies uh, or societies around the world, communities around the world that are very cut off, like the, the genders are cut off from one another. I haven't seen that level of modesty even there, right? Why? Because the imam and the community made a special effort to make sure that they work on the hearts of the people, understand that they have a responsibility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why, you know, when I give talks on gender interaction, I'm like, look, I can give you 20 rules of how to interact with the opposite gender, but rule number one of sincerity with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if that is not met, then none of it matters because there's always going to be a loophole, right? Some people talk about the issue of khalwa. You know, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, That a man is not alone with a woman except a third of them is the shaitan, right? And this tells us in our deen, a man is not supposed to be alone with a woman that is not mahram, right? But this is very clear. There's, there's no... Uh, there's no uh, uh, this is not something which is ambiguous. There should be no khalwa. If a person is not fearing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if they're not conscious of Allah, then they'll even find loopholes in, in that. Uh, 
Uh, what happens when it comes to communication? Yeah, you know, they're not a man or woman. They're not in a room alone together, but maybe they'll find ways to be in a conversation together. You know, nowadays with, you know, social media and, you know, WhatsApp and messaging and so on and so forth, people will find a way to, to, to a loophole for that, for that rule if the heart is not uh, taken care of. And that is why our deen teaches us that beauty comes from haya. Beauty comes from, it's not a restrictive. And oftentimes when we think of haya, we think of it as something restrictive. When we think of modesty, and I used to do this exercise in my class, I say, I'm going to say a word and you tell me what comes to your mind. And uh, I say modesty. And people used to say uh, hijab, covering up, um, you know, uh, restricted, confined, so on and so forth. And I said, it's very interesting that we have this association with modesty, which I have no doubt this comes from the shaitan, because one of the tricks of the shaitan, by the way, is to uh, do negative associations with good things, meaning take something good and make it appear bad. And he does the opposite as well. He takes uh, bad things and he makes them appear good to us so that we may fall, fall into it. But this negative association, definitely the shaitan encourages this. In, in our deen, there's a positive association with haya. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, مَا كَانَ الْحَيَاءُ فِي شَيْءٍ إِلَّا الزَّانَ Haya is not played, is, uh, placed, a modesty is not placed in anything except that it makes it beautiful. Right? When we think of modesty, we don't often think about beauty. Right? We think about fighting and restricting beauty and so on and so forth. It's just that this is a beauty that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And actually it is pleasing to our fitrah as well. It is pleasing to our nafs. It is pleasing to our soul. Because the standards of beauty and what is considered beautif- beautiful um, gets perverted in, in society. And this is why we begin to be uh, affected, but we, we begin to af- define beauty uh, in, in ways that are actually not pleasing to our soul. But our, st- our understanding of beauty or our concept of beauty has been perverted and changed. Where subhanAllah, now we live in a society, apologize for the for the meme, you know, we live in a society, but we live in a society where nakedness is associated with beauty. And if you look at the fitrah, right, you look at our nafs, our nature, it is the opposite of that. If a person was left alone, they were not affected by society, they were not affected by anyone, when they would see nakedness, they would turn away, they would shy away. Because the nafs says this is odd. It's something very, very private. This is not something that should be out and about. Like everyone should not be exposed to it. The nafs understands this. But as society changes, we begin to associate something that is that we would not normally like. Our nafs would not, our soul, our, our self naturally, the fitrah is what we naturally like. Naturally, we would not like that. Uh, but it gets changed. And this is why it's very interesting, subhanAllah, you know, in, in the trend seminar, we talk about nakedness. And uh, we mentioned this opinion of, of, of some of our scholars that say that even if a person is alone in their home or in their, in their, in their room, they should not, and I know it sounds weird to, to say this and I apologize, uh, they should not just walk around naked, right? Now, are they doing something which is haram? No, it's not haram. You know, if nobody's looking at you, you're by yourself, you're in your room. And I, and I, I know this sounds really, really weird and I apologize for this. Um, but if you're alone, right? No, it's not haram to walk around naked. But some of our scholars say it is makru. It is disliked. It is discouraged. Why? Because it chips away at our sense of modesty. It ch- chips away at our sense of, uh, of covering up, uh, of, of being modest with, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why, you know, we have, we know Uthman radiallahu an was this companion who had a very elevated sense of modesty. That even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recognized that this is a person Whose, whose modesty was at a as uh, was at a very high level. We had this incident mentioned in, in Sahih Bukhari, uh, in which the Prophet sallallahu alaihi sorry in Sahih Muslim Hadith Aisha radhiyallahu anha, in which uh, this incident takes place where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is uh, lying in his bed, uh, in in his apartment, and his thigh is uncovered, right? Not his uh, private area, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but his thigh. His thigh is uncovered, uh, or a portion of his thigh, we can say. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she says that he's sitting, basically he's laying down on, 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 uh, on his bed. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anha walks in. And the Prophet sallam, uh, Aisha, she says that uh, the Prophet doesn't change the way he's sitting. Then she says some time passed and, you know, Abu Bakr radiallahu anha, he walks in and the Prophet stays in the same state. 
and he talks to him for some time, and then some time goes by, uh, and then Umar radiallahu an walks in, and the Prophet doesn't change the way he is sitting, meaning his thigh is still exposed. And then uh, some time passes by, and Uthman radiallahu anhu radiallahu walks in, and the Prophet uh, when he hears that Uthman radiallahu an is coming, he sits up and he covers his thigh. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And Aisha radiallahu anha, as we know, she was very curious and Jazakallah uh, khair, Allah be pleased with her. Because of her, we learned so much. Uh, she asked the question that we're now all thinking, which is, she says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, I noticed that when Abu Bakr walked in, you didn't change the way you were sitting. When Umar radiallahu an walked in, you didn't change the way you were sitting. But when Uthman walked in, you covered yourself, you covered your thigh and you sat up. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Ala astahi min rajulin tastahi minhu al-malaika. He said, should I not be shy in front of the one whom the angels are shy in front of? Right? This is the level of modesty that Uthman radiallahu an had an elevated, high level of modesty. And, you know, this hadith, by the way, comes under the, the issues. Uh, it is brought up under the issue of, <clears throat> is the thigh part of men's aura or not, right? And I don't want to get into a, <clears throat> a fiqh, <clears throat> a fiqh discussion here. If you're interested in this topic, uh, check out the trends seminar that I teach. And I actually, we go over this in the Faith Essentials as well, in uh, the Al-Maghrib portal. You can check that out if you want the details of the men's aura and the khilaf regarding that. That's not the point here. The point here is that if we understand modesty, then we would be aware of our nakedness to a heightened level, right? And that is why the Prophet Sallam, it clicked for him. Uthman radiallahu an came. He covered up his thigh, sallallahu alayhi wa That is an elevated level of modesty. And, and, and that, my brothers and sisters, the, the beauty about modesty in haya is that it is contagious. When we are modest, it affects other people as well. And it creates an environment of modesty. This is very interesting, the, the story of Musa alayhi salam. When he went to the well of Madian. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us this mention of uh, Qasas. Uh, of how he interacted uh, with the two women. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَمَّا وَرَدَ مَاءَ مَدْيَنْ When Musa alayhi salam, when he came to the well of Madian, وَجَدَ عَلَيْهِ أُمَّةً مِنَ النَّاسِ يَسْقُونَ He found a group of people there. Basically what they were doing was they were getting water from the well and they were giving that water to their animals. And then, وَوَجَدَ مِن دُونِهِمْ إِمْرَأَتَيْنْ تَذُودَانَ He found two women who were there, but they were holding back. They weren't able to give water to their animals. And he addressed them. He said, قَالَ مَا خَطَبُكُمَا He said, what is the issue? Like what issue are you facing? قَالَتَا they said, the two of them said, لا نسقي حتى يصدر الرعاب. They said, we cannot water our animals until basically the other shepherds are done. So there's a bunch of men now. They're crowding the area. You know, it's it's probably getting rough. They're, 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 they're getting water out of the well and they're giving uh, water to the animals and there's animals there and there's men there and so on and so forth. And these two women, they say, you know, uh, we want to give water to our animals as well, but we can't do so because it's crowded by men. And they say, abuna shaykhun kabir. What does that mean? Our father is an old man. But what that means is, what is understood here is that normally our father would do this. Like our father would be here among the men, going into the, getting water from the well, giving water to the animals. But he's old. He, he doesn't have the ability to do it. We have to do it. And, you know, so we're, we're unable to do it right now. Uh, and, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, فَسَقَى لَهُمَا ثُمَّ تَوَلَّ إِلَى ظِلْ he, uh, he gave, he basically, when he saw that they're having this problem, he got water for their, he brought water for their animals, then he retreated to the shade. Uh, and then uh, he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, فَقَالَ رَبِّ إِنِّي لِمَا أَنزَلْتَ إِلَيَّ مِنْ خَيْرٍ فَقِيرٍ He prayed, he made dua, he said, my Lord, I'm truly desperately in need of whatever uh, provisions, whatever good you can bestow upon me. And then, the two women come to Musa alayhi salam. فَجَاءَتُ إِحْدَاهُمَا So, what, sorry, one of the women come to Musa alayhi salam. فَجَاءَتُ إِحْدَاهُمَا تَمْشِي عَلَى إِسْتِحْيَا Allah tells us that one of the women, they come to Musa alayhi salam, they want to speak to him. 
But how do they approach Musa alayhi salam? They approach Musa alayhi salam with haya, right? With modesty. And then they said to him, قالت, In Abi yad'uka li, li ajra ma lana. They said, our father is calling you, inviting you to reward you, to give you a reward, to reward you for the water that you have provided for our animals. Now, in this whole, in these few verses, where is the modesty of, of Musa alayhi salam? It is not literally spelled out, but if you contemplate these verses, it becomes very, very clear. Some people say, well, he uh, was direct and to the point. He didn't go to them uh, uh, and say, hi, how are you? How's it going? What's up? What's going on? Where are you from? Da, 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 da. He just saw that these two women are in distress. And he said, what's going on? They explained their problem to him and he went and he helped. After he helped them, he didn't go and continue the conversation and say, where are you from? And this is that. And even subhanAllah noticed that uh, the two women, they, they said, uh, uh, they said, Abuna Shaykhun Kabir. They said, Our father's an old man. He didn't make istifsar after that. He didn't say, Well, uh, okay, so he's old. What's wrong with him? Where does he live? He didn't even ask any more questions about their father, right? He didn't get into this long, drawn out conversation. He understood what's happening. He gave water to the, uh, he, provide, he, he fulfilled their need. And then he didn't continue any conversation. He went and retreated uh, to the shade and he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even though Musa alayhi salam was in need right now, he could have said, Listen, I did this for you. Can you help me out? Because Musa alayhi salam, when he came to Madian, he came with nothing. And some of the scholars of Tafsir even mentioned that he didn't even have shoes. So he truly had nothing, nothing, nothing to his name. He came desperately. Uh, in, that's why he said, uh, Rabbi inni lima anzalta ilayya, uh, min khayrin faqir. He said, My Lord, I'm desperately in need of whatever you can bestow upon me. Right? He, he came with nothing. He could have asked them, for something, but he did not. So that's one. On top of that, if you reflect upon these verses, it becomes clear to us that his modesty is, is understood by the modesty of the two women. Because now when the women wanted to speak to him, how did they approach him? They approached him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, uh, one of them came to him, tamshi ala istihya. she was walking with modesty. Where did this come from? This came from the modesty of Musa alayhi salam. Because Musa alayhi salam had created an environment of modesty. And this is why all it takes is one person in the interaction to be modest and it will affect the other person. If one person is conscious of Allah, knows that Allah is watching them, knows that they have to answer to Allah. They are checking their intentions. And this is one thing I always tell young brothers and sisters when you're talking to, you know, often get asked like, how much are we allowed to talk? Uh, what are we allowed to ask? You know, how much is, you know, the, uh, people say like, keep the conversation formal. Okay, who defines formal, right? Because in one environment, something may be formal and another environment may not be formal. In one uh, society, something may be formal and another society, something may not be formal. Depending on where you live, people can talk in different ways. So there's a lot of, there can be a lot of gray area there. Well, if you are questioning yourself and asking yourself, what is my intention behind this conversation? Do I want to please Allah? Or if I'm talking to somebody of the opposite gender, and you know what? I want them to like me. I want them um, to enjoy this conversation. I want to get, uh, I, I want to feel good. I want the other person to feel good. Now our intentions are messed up, right? And so, that is the question we need to be asking ourselves. Like, what do I want out of this conversation? Is it simply, I need to ask this person a question and this, and that it's done? Or I want this person to like me, right? And I want this person to feel a certain way. And I feel a certain way. And then now we're getting into now the reality of what is happening in the heart. And then we need to seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from having those feelings and thoughts. And now we center ourselves with what is correct. With, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rectify our intention and continue the conversation in that way. But because Musa alayhi salam was modest, of course it had an effect on the two women as well. And that is why, as I said, it, all it takes is one person to be modest and it will have an effect on the other people. And I always tell parents even, subhanAllah, it's one thing to um, you know, tell your children to behave in a modest way, to talk in a modest way, to dress in a modest way. It's another thing to, to practically show them what it means to be modest in our, in our interaction. All of us, I'm sure, and this is an uncomfortable thing to, to think about and talk about. All of us, we can think back to our childhood and we can remember how 
you know, my father used to talk to other women, how my mom used to talk to other men. And that, of course, had an effect upon us. And so now that we are, and I'm speaking to the parents who are listening right now, now that we are parents, we need to think about our children. When we are interacting with the opposite gender, what are our children seeing? Are our children seeing an embodiment of, uh, of what haya in Islam is supposed to look like? Are they learning? Instead of us saying, you know, you should do this and you shouldn't do that. Are they seeing a living example of modesty? In different circumstances, we can talk to our kids all we want, and it's good to talk to our kids. But showing them through experience means we show them that when we're in the grocery store, how do we act? When we go to the masjid, how do we act? I've heard kids say, you know, people act a certain. I've seen my. I've heard kids say, like my parents in the masjid, they're all religious and they act a certain way. But where when they're out in the bank or the grocery store, or whatever, they're not the same way. They'll never say that to their parents. But I've heard them say this. So some of them are, feel comfortable, com- comfortable enough to say it to me, right? And if they're saying it to me, uh, this is probably like 5% of what's going on in their head because children think about this stuff. They, they, they think about, and this happens internally. You know, how is my, why is my dad behaving in this way or why is my mom behaving in this way? And so if we are, if we are living that example, then our children see how we behave in all different circumstances, how we dress, how we interact, how we talk, all that has an effect on our children. And so I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us good role models uh, for our children, for our communities, uh, for those uh, who, even, even for, for non-Muslims. Uh, Subhanallah, I'll just share with you uh, one last story and I'll end it there. Uh, recently, I was in Florida and uh, at uh, one of the fundraisers, it was an Islamic Relief fundraiser. Uh, and uh, there's a woman uh, who's running for Congress uh, in Florida, and I had happened to 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 learn about her online um, that she is uh, anti-Zionist. She's 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 Jewish, uh, but she's pro-Palestine, and she's she's uh, she's uh, anti-Zionism, and uh, she's running against um, the congressman uh, or the congresswoman from Florida, who is actually very 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 pro-Zionist, pro-Israel, and so uh, so I I came across her. And I was like, I just wanted to say hi to her. I want to say, look, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. Keep speaking out. Uh, it's good that we have someone running against a, a very pro-Zionist, uh, you know, congresswoman. And uh, that's all I wanted to say. And it's amazing, subhanAllah. I, I, I approached her and she said, hello. I said, hello. And she said, uh, and she, she looked at me out there. She goes, uh, do, you, do you shake hands? I said, no, I don't. And she goes, no problem. And she said, this is my... I don't know, somebody who works with her, a man. And she said, uh, whatever. And he shook my hand and I shook his hand. And I'm like, someone educated her. She met a Muslim, without a doubt. She met a Muslim, <clears throat> a Muslim man or a Muslim woman. And they explained to her the modesty of Islam, how Muslims behave. The touch, like t- that's a hard and fast rule, right? <laughs> like not being alone with the opposite gender. That's a hard and fast rule. Uh, not touching. Someone who's not mahab to us. That's a hard and fast rule. Uh, so someone explained that to her and look the effect that it had upon her and I noticed that this interaction subhanAllah could have been an uncomfortable interaction but now it was a comfortable and at the same inshallah ta'ala, a modest interaction as well so I ask Allah subhanahu ta'ala, to make us role models and examples and uh, forgive our shortcomings and to grant us uh, haya that makes us uh, like the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam هذا والله تعالى أعلم سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك